Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. Today we have a live hangout for the MedGadget.com channel. Uh, we're meeting with Joel Benke of Bionest Incorporated of Valencia, California. He's going to talk about his company's products uh, that utilize electrical simulation. And we're also joined by the editor of MedGadget, Gene Ostrovsky. We'll introduce Gene first. Hey, Gene. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm the managing editor of MedGadget, and Joel, thank you for coming. Um, we're excited to have you here. Thank Very you good. for the invite. I appreciate it. Very good. Welcome, Gene. Okay, Joel, it's all yours. Sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Benin, for, for the invite. I um, want to talk to you um, a little bit today about, about Bionis, but more specifically, really, uh, stroke rehabilitation, because that's where we're focusing on as a company and the technologies that we have that are being deployed in that arena. Um, to, to combat those functional deficits, both of the upper extremity and lower extremity, as well as the chronic pain that many of these um, survivors have as a result of their stroke. Um, Bionis uh, has been around since 2004. We're actually an offshoot uh, of the Alfred Mann Foundation. Uh, anybody who's been in medical device for you know, you know, any sort of time uh, knows um, Alfred Mann and the legacy that he leaves behind. He recently passed away at the age of 90, although he had a you know a 50 to 60 year uh, record of bringing innovations to underserved patient populations, and that's really where Bionis is focused in, uh, bringing evidence-based technologies to stroke, which is a severely underserved patient population, not only in the U.S. but but worldwide. So I have a brief uh, presentation today, and then. You know, after we get done with the presentation, hopefully it'll elicit some questions and we can talk a little bit more about uh, stroke, stroke patient, and then our, our clinical solutions that are being deployed across the country to address those deficits. Sounds good. Thank you. So when you look at bonus technologies and the, the devices that we have, um, from the markets that were indicated for with the FDA and also the markets that we're going after, approximately 1 in 15 people in the U.S. will be afflicted with a, an ailment that we will be able to potentially service, whether that's paralysis or chronic pain or some, some new markets that we're going into and in starting some clinical research specifically in overactive bladder. Uh, there's a, a vast opportunity for neuromodulation technologies, really was what our core is, um, to, to service these individuals. So I bring this slide up here on the, the prevalence and incidence of the major markets that we service. These are enormous numbers. So while we're going to talk primarily about stroke today and its cost on the U.S. healthcare system, which is about $69 billion a year, uh, I don't want to overlook uh, the other major central nervous system pathologies on that list, including multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, and cerebral palsy. You know, all combined said, these five diagnoses represent about $170 billion of health care costs annually just in the U.S. alone. Um, these numbers are growing. Um, they're not going away as, you know, the interventions to save uh, people that have had these injuries, specifically stroke, Traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury improve. These numbers are only going to get larger uh, as time goes on. Specific to our implantable neuromodulation uh, technology, uh, which is called the stim router, these are really the three major uh, patient populations that we're focused in on um, is peripheral pain, right? The, the current treatment for pain on the med device side is spinal cord stimulation. Um, so we're focused on the peripheral pain aspect of modulating, uh, while our spinal cord stimulation is focused on the central nervous system uh, origin. Um, specific to our company, we really are focused in on the post-stroke uh, pain uh, because we are already servicing that patient right now when we are we're in over 80% of the top rehab facilities in the country, so it's a natural call point for us. Uh, overactive bladder, which I mentioned earlier, is on this list. You see those numbers, that those are, these are the current estimates from the CDC about the number of people uh, that have uh, these ailments. Not all of them seek treatment, right? There's still a stigma uh, in seeking a treatment for this, uh, and most of it is done through uh, pharma. 
Um, but we are currently in, in conversations with the FDA to start an uh, IDE uh, study for this indication later this year. So the add up the, the markets previously, which was $171 billion plus $250 billion here, right? You're looking at some pretty large numbers of just uh, these patients that our technology could potentially service. So stroke awareness. I think stroke, uh, the, the marketing people on the side of stroke have done a relatively poor job when you compare it to uh, cancer advocacy, uh, heart disease advocacy, um, because stroke is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. Over five and a half million people in this country uh, suffer disability as a result of a stroke. You know, the slide earlier was that there was 800,000 strokes a year. Um, that's one every 40 seconds. So you think about those numbers, uh, they're not going down, they're going up. And a lot of that's due to lifestyle, a lot of it's due to genetics, but um, it is the fifth leading cause of death in the country. It actually was the third leading cause of death in 2010. So that number is going down, but the number of strokes per year isn't going down. It's, it's going up or staying the same. So the interventions to save these individuals uh, are getting much, much better. But that also puts a toll on the healthcare infrastructure and that the rehabilitation needs for these individuals post the incident is growing quite significantly. And the number one goal in, right now for you know, stroke rehabilitation is really to get that patient safe, both medically safe and physically safe, uh, to get them to the next point of rehabilitation. So quick, quick overview of the rehabilitation market. This is a market that's not very well understood uh, by even medical professionals, uh, let alone you know people in the in the med device uh, marketplace, it really has been a, an area that has been underserved with technology. So we started in 2004, um, and we were, we were being a relatively newcomer. I think ignorance was bliss, and that we were able to bring the H200, which is our upper extremity device, into the market, um, and really change the paradigm of rehabilitation by implementing clinically based uh, technology tools rather than just um, devices or uh, other, other types of technology for the sake of it just being there and coming out of an academic setting. This actually came out of a clinical research setting that was geared towards spinal cord injury but then adopted for stroke just given the, the prevalence of individuals that could benefit from it. Um, there has been a surge of, of gamification in rehab and I think this is um, focused in on getting um, patients motivated, you know, having a stroke specifically is a pretty demoralizing event. Um, and the game, the gamification element, you know, allows them to add some of a playful nature to it uh, and restore some normalcy. I would say there's been uh, an over gamification of the technology where um, it's been uh, less focused on medical interventions, assessments, and actually uh, quantifying outcomes um, than, it, than it should have been. And we have a product that, that I think, you know, spans bo both those worlds pretty well. Also, and probably most prominently known are the exoskeleton systems. There's a number of companies that have these devices that have developed out of an academia setting, both here in the U.S. as well as internationally. Um, and so these devices are being used primarily for spinal cord injury to get patients that are in wheelchairs up and walking uh, they are powered and assistive devices, so the patient's not moving on their own, rather the machine's working for them. But there's a lot of derivative plays that they, you know, talked about uh, outside of rehabilitation, including in the industrial applications. Um, but like I said, the, they're they're pretty expensive uh, and they're rather cumbersome and, and, and hard to manage. So it makes adoption in the typical uh, setting rather challenging. Uh, and then other robotic technologies, this is our system, it's called the, the Vector Gate and Safety System. This is really focused on getting patients up and walking and doing activities before they could uh, normally. So the standard of care right now is two or three therapists handling a patient, holding them up, getting them to walk. Well, this device uh, promotes that one-to-one -one clinician ratio and offloads a precise amount of body weight so that patient can get up ambulating and doing activities faster than they would before in a much safer environment. So the stroke pathway uh, for these patients has become rather complicated. 
uh, and it really is driven by the changes in reimbursement and how that's changed the, the way medicine's been deployed. So you have really a three-stage um, pathway for stroke. You have your level one trauma, which they're typically there for three to four days, and this is where they go right after the stroke happens. Um, at that point, they're going to be going to acute rehab, and this is where the reimbursement factor is and that these facilities are getting a fixed payment for that patient coming into their, into their hospital. So whether that patient stays there for 14 days or they stay there for 28 days, the hospital is getting the same amount of money from the insurance companies or from Medicare. So the, really the, uh, the onus, even for the nonprofits, is to get that patient medically stable and safe as soon as possible so they can turn that bed, right, and see more patients. There's a lot more money in having an average length of stay of only 14 days as opposed to 21 days over the course of the year. Well, with that said, as that length of stay shortens, right, these patients probably have not gotten the, as much rehab as, as they should have for the next step where in the past they were traditionally going to your outpatient rehab outlet, which is on the top there, or a day rehab program, which is an intensive uh, three to five hour program um, that, that they go to. Rather, now they're going into those bottom three as a, as a larger proportion, you know, a skilled nurf nursing facility, home rehab, or a nursing home. So couple the reimbursement constraints to the fact that we talked about earlier with more of these individuals surviving the incident, right? So you see the burden really is placed on the bottom three tier right now uh, of where these individuals are going. So we talked about this a little bit. So the there's not a lot of money right now uh, in in healthcare for um, for outpatient rehab. So that's all the money in, in, is really skewed towards the prospective payment system, which is based on those fixed payments of that individual going into the hospital. So you see those amounts for uh, physical therapy and speech therapy are capped at about two thousand dollars per year. You think about the amount of health care you can get for $2,000 with a specialized profession, it, it's pretty low. Uh, occupational therapy has the same cap as well. Um, so the outpatient is really constrained in their ability to treat a patient. So they normally eat up this amount of money in probably six to eight visits. Uh, while that those caps can be extended, it's pretty ambiguous right now with the changes in, in health care and the Affordable Care Act and the new CPT codes as to what constitutes a functional change which will get the patients back into rehab for a longer length of stay. So a lot of times these facilities will treat on risk um, with no guarantee of payment uh, on the other side. So there is a lot of risk on that outpatient side. These are the primary stakeholders that are involved in the rehab process and the, and the individuals that Bionis primarily calls upon. Um, you, have, uh, you have your primary physician, which is called a physiatrist, and then your three therapy disciplines, physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. The big difference uh, from my experience in rehab as opposed to orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery is that the, the physician in this area is not... Um, not the, the A driver, right, the personality that's really driving um, the process. It's, it really comes from the bottom up, from the, the disciplines of speech, occupational, physical therapy, crafting that plan for the patient, and then the physician having oversight into that, right? Co you know, compare that to an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon, which they're, that, that's, that's a top-down uh, treatment approach, where in rehab it's a bottom-up treatment approach. So the opportunity in rehab uh, is, is quite vast. Uh, it is a, a developing market, uh, and it's one that I think is going to be burdened with, with uh, the lion's share of taking care of these uh, diagnoses long term, especially as the interventions get better and the rates and the, and the incidents get higher. So we're really focused on reducing injuries, preparing for the community integration, Right, the, it's very expensive to have a stroke patient go home if, if they're not medically stable and they fall and break a, a femur or a hip, right? Then they get readmitted and the prognosis for that individual becomes rather bleak. So focusing more efforts on getting that patient safe and giving them adaptive equipment to get them, uh, you know, to be more successful after discharge. Shortening the length of stay, that's, you know, we, it may not be an ideal situation, 
Uh, in Europe, you know, patients are able to stay much longer in inpatient rehab. That's not the case here. Um, so you have to work within those boundaries as a company and with technology to, to cater to that reality. Um, increased productivity. So the therapists uh, that we deal with day in and day out are really stretched and, you know, seen as many patients as possible. And they've seen those treatment sessions go from 75 minutes per session down to 30 minutes per session in some instances. So they are really constrained. Um, generate additional referrals. Like I said earlier, whether it's, you're dealing with a nonprofit organization or a for-profit hospital group, um, everybody's interested in, in getting more referrals, and that's you know companies that use technology as a selling point to to cater to that need have been you know are successful. And this market's technology hungry. Um, the evolution at these the trade shows, which is always my barometer of uh, how technology is being absorbed in the market. Uh, has changed dramatically from 2006 when I started with Bionis to 2016. Um, there's a lot more innovation, there's a lot more technology, uh, but that technology's got to be paired to not only reimbursement in the facility, but also reimbursement in, in the home setting, which is becoming ever important at, with the changes in healthcare. So the Bionis product portfolio consists of six devices. Uh, today I'm going to focus primarily on the stim router device, which is in your upper left-hand corner, which is a device for chronic peripheral pain. This is an implantable device. Uh, and the L300 and the L300 Plus, which are essentially the, the same product. They just actually have different FDA clearances, but they're part of the same family. Uh, we also have the H200 wireless. So those top four products all use neuromodulation or electrical stimulation to either produce functional movement patterns in the upper or lower extremity, or reduce chronic pain. On the bottom left, we have the vector gate and safety system, which is that robotic system that dynamically offloads a precise amount of uh, weight with that patient. So whether it's a neurologic patient that has had a stroke or an orthopedic patient where they're mandated to 50% weight bearing, this product can be used for that. And then the, the BITS, or the Bionis Integrated Therapy System, which is our, our visual motor assessment uh, and evaluation tool, uh, which is really our central hub for all our clinical technologies to, to have all our programs on there. So all told, we have six FDA cleared devices, and um, as far as an IP portfolio, over 170 licensed patents worldwide. So the L300 and the L300 Plus. So the L300 uh, consists of a lower extremity uh, cuff that houses uh, stimulating electrodes. So this device is actually uses functional electrical stimulation to stimulate the nerves and the muscles that lift the foot during gait. So one of the, one of the big issues that plagues the individuals that, that we see, um, primarily stroke, is that they, they lose the ability to, to lift up their foot. And it's, it's something that we take for granted, uh, you know, as we, as we ambulate. But, the, you know, you think about a foot dragging, what a falling hazard that would be. And usually that that foot drop is also tied to other paralysis in that extremity. So they develop weakness at the knee, at the hip, so that whole extremity is then, is then impacted. So this device has been out since, uh, has been on the market since late 2006. So it is a relatively, in the world of technology, relatively old device, but it's been uh, really tried and true over the past few years as we gained momentum and just last year we got recognized by Frost and Sullivan as the 2015 market leader uh, in this category. So the device consists and you see the picture in the upper right hand corner uh, of a uh, two orthoses, one is for the lower leg, one is for the thigh which can be applied to the hamstrings uh, or the quadriceps depending on the patient presentation. And then there's a sensor that goes in the shoe. So this is a dynamic sensor that detects gait events uh, and adapts to the patient as they progress, as they walk faster, as they change terrain. The algorithm in there automatically adapts and adjusts to, to those changes in the patient's gait. So just want to show you a quick video of a side-by-side -side comparison uh, of a stroke patient using uh, the L300 and then also a spinal cord injury patient. There's a lot of videos uh, on YouTube uh, of news clips. Um, one of the most popular one is one of an MS patient that was 
uh, on the Today Show a few years ago. It was it was pretty successful, but I'll show you these side by side clips. Ooh. Sorry about that. So you see here on the left hand side, and it may be a little choppy with the internet connection, so I apologize. Uh, the patient has. Uh, obvious foot drop and they're going up one of the most challenging terrains that a patient can really incur it is uphill on grass so an uneven surface with foot drop presentation and then using the EL300 which is where we're stimulating those uh, the nerves and the muscles to lift up the foot during gait you see the foot clearance that the patient's getting to be able to ambulate on this terrain safely so the current intervention right now that's used for um, this ailment is an AFO, so it's an ankle foot orthosis. This is a plastic brace that puts the patient's leg in a locked position, um, and this device will take the place of that so the patient's actually using their own physiology, um, but own physiology without the need of a brace. So here we have a, a spinal cord injury patient. So this patient actually is presenting uh, with a bilateral devices. So here, this gentleman was in a motorcycle accident and out of work. You can see that not only do they, does he have the issue of not being able to walk, but he has the, uh, the tremor, which is called clonus, and the electrical stimulation and neuromodulation not only helps clear the foot and provide stability at the, at the knee, but also cleans up uh, some of the, the sensory issues that the individual is having. So pretty remarkable difference, what, right? This isn't indicative of all the things that we see every time, but I think it's a pretty dramatic uh, showing of what the technology can do for a patient. Um, and, you know, to humanize this, this gentleman was actually able to go back to work after uh, the insurance covered the devices for him. So, that's where technology is meeting, you know, the human story is really where the, the value here uh, of this is happening. So like I, I indicated earlier, uh, technology for the sake of technology is this that. It's uh, really tied to clinical outcomes and you see here in the graph on the right hand side, um, it was, this is a, I think it was, these are 90, 98 patients, uh, subacute and chronic stroke. After 42 weeks, they were actually able to improve their gait speed by 45%. So gait speed is a real determinant of, of falls and safety. So um, this, this information is, is quite credible. Second uh, technology I want to highlight is, is the stim router. Um, we just uh, launched this device this year, got FDA clearance in 2015. Um, this device consists of three components. Uh, you have uh, a, an implanted lead, which is passive, um, with an external pulse transmitter with a patient programmer. So this is for individuals with chronic peripheral pain um, that are having, um, it's really mononeuropathic pain uh, and being able to treat the pain right at the site of the injury. So where pharmaceuticals, right, treats the whole body, as far as pain goes, this is actually treating the nerve that's directly causing the pain itself. So it is obviously um, prescription only, uh, and you see the lead here on the right-hand side, and I think you saw it in my, actually this is my hand here with the lead, so it's a very highly flexible lead with three integrated electrodes at the end, and that this whole piece is, is implanted. So what are our goals? I mean, the the, the right the news on opioid and, and heroin addiction right now is a pretty hot topic, and, and rightfully so. Um, so we we'll really look at reducing dependency on those pharmaceutical agents, improving outcomes where technology does not exist, um, simplify the procedure. So anybody that's familiar with spinal cord stimulation as a way to neuromodulate pain knows that you have implanted electronics and imp implanted battery. It's quite an invasive uh, procedure for lead tunneling. We're looking at a procedure that's about 20 to 30 minutes in a standard outpatient setting um, and a very, very quick recovery time uh, for these individuals that, that would be appropriate. And then expanding patient population. So this is where we factor in the, the stroke patient that we're currently working with right now and looking at post-stroke shoulder pain.
So the pain that uh, afflicts stroke patients in the shoulder typically originates from the axillary nerve. It can originate from others, but primarily it's the axillary nerve. And whereas foot drop, which we looked at with the L300, affects about 20% of stroke survivors, uh, shoulder pain has been reported as low as 30% and as high as 85% of stroke survivors develop shoulder pain. So it's quite a large market, especially when you consider that 5.5 million people um, have long-term disabilities as a result of the stroke. So just a quick mention of, of our other technologies. This is the H200 wireless hand rehab system. Uh, this device uses five integrated electrodes to provide functional uh, movement patterns in the hand, flex flexion and extension um, to help with uh, muscle spasms, disuse atrophy, uh, and also activities of daily living. If anybody's familiar with Botox uh, for cosmetics, it's also used for um, spasticity management uh, in, in patients that have stroke or traumatic brain injury. And many times H200 will be used in combination with that therapy to, to, to help increase its effectiveness. We talked about the, the vector system. Uh, the vector was launched in 2013. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it can be used in combination essentially with all our other products. Um, it is a capital uh, investment that the facility makes. Uh, it's a zero footprint rail system. Uh, that provides off dynamic uh, body weight support. So I put the websites uh, at the bottom uh, of this slide so if people want to check out more information on the products themselves, they can. Uh, and the last one is the, the BITS, the Bionis Integrated Therapy System. So this is a new technology. We actually just launched the second version of the software this month, uh, focused on visual motor impairments uh, and doing standardized assessments, which therapists have been doing with paper and pen and then digitizing it onto a, a large touchscreen uh, monitor. So that's a quick overview uh, of, the, of the technologies. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you guys may, may have after going through that presentation or on the diagnosis specifically. Very good, Joel. Thank you for a very clear professional presentation. Uh, Gene, do you want to start off with some questions? Uh, Jake, uh, can you turn down your speakers a bit with your cell? We have an echo here. What's what's going on? Uh, uh, hmm. Let me turn off. Okay. Okay, it's much better. Okay. Go ahead, Gene. You want to start off with a question? Yeah, I'm wondering, does the the L three hundred device does it does it uh, work with other? Uh, I mean, can you use it with exoskeletons, for example, or with other technologies at the same time? Or? Uh, and, and it's, other, it's not indicated to be used with any other technology at the same time. Therapists are, are rather creative, so if there's not any uh, infringement on where it can be placed or antagonist uh, mechanisms with what's going on with the patient, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure they, they, they've used it that way, but it's not indicated to be used uh, in combination with anything else at this point. What about... Um uh, therapy is, is it? Uh, it's it's not a replacement for therapy. I'm, I'm guessing, right? The therapy still has to uh, be done. It it's not, and actually, that, that's a great point. So one of the one of the things that we found in, in our big research study uh, that we're using to make an, an argument for uh, CMS Medicare coverage is the conjunction of the technology in combination with therapy. So we've seen the best outcomes when the technology has been deployed. And use with with therapy for you know six up to ten visits. And part of the study was incorporating that physical therapy physical therapy aspect into use of the device outside the clinic. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a question. Quick question, Joel. You know, I was surprised at the numbers and the cost of stroke uh, and TBI. Um, they're both in huge numbers: fifty-six million and seventy million billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, and I know you mostly address stroke today, but do you, is there a pain component with the TBI too, or is it mostly stroke that you found is the big pain component? Yeah, the, the, the issue with TBI is how it's reported. So the, the spectrum of traumatic brain injury could be anything from an urgent care visit to a concussion to long-term disability and how the CDC categorizes that. So um, it's less specific and yeah, our, any company's ability to say, you know, this segment of the TBI would be 
would be would be appropriate. But yeah, it absolutely is a is a big part of it because many patients with traumatic brain injury present just like a stroke patient. Yeah. Um, so it's a smaller percentage of that overall prevalence, but it is still a, a large piece. Okay. Have, have there been any studies comparing uh, your device with analgesics uh, at all? Do you know? Uh, not, not, not that I'm aware of. No. No, not yet. No. Uh, or, or do you? Do you? Uh, I guess it's used in combination sometimes with analgesics. Correct. Yeah. The 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 stim router would be. Okay. Very good. Um, the, the stim router. So. Uh, like you said, the other stimulators, they you know, the, you have to implant the whole, all, all the electronics and everything with it. How how come other manufacturers aren't doing the same thing? What's the limitation there? Sure, a lot of it, you know, they go after the the large um, reimbursement values. So the spinal cord stimulators typically reimburse at twenty to twenty five thousand dollars. You know we're going to be coming in at a price point much lower to help expand that that market. Um, so the reimbursement, you know, with uh, our implant is right around six thousand dollars. So developing a technology that is going to undercut your spinal cord stimulation uh, sales a little bit because um, there is a portion of the implants every year at twenty to twenty-five thousand that are done for peripheral nerve stimulation. So you'd essentially cut your ASP for those implants by, you know, 80%. So there's not a lot of motivation there. Uh, I think the, the motivation comes with other indications, and you see, you'll see that with the overactive bladder uh, component. There's a lot of technologies that are using and bringing to market peripheral nerve stimulation to address uh, OAB. Um, and you know, a lot of them have not been commercialized. They're in the investigation stage. But I think that's where you're going to be seeing the technology go is for a more specific application like that rather than regional or complex pain syndromes. Mm -hmm. Can you can you talk a little about the, about the bladder? Like you said, it's underreported. People are embarrassed probably yep. uh, to report it. Can you uh, explain a little bit and how it works? Uh, how, sure. how it would help patients a little bit? Yeah, there's. Uh, I'm not, I won't speak specifically to the product just because the FDA restrictions. But from a physiology standpoint, there's been a number of studies, and we actually have done a pilot study up in Canada with a few patients where stimulating the tibial nerve, which is at the the bottom of the leg, right. uh, provides uh, you know a physiological impact on strengthening the the bladder for urge and stress incontinence. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it's a it's a very easy nerve to to access. Yeah. Um, most, there there is a technology out there right now where the, the therapy is being done in the physician's office. There's mm -hmm. currently no therapy that's on the market where the patient can actually administer the therapy at home. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that that's sort of the new frontier uh, of kind of getting over the stigma. I think of being able to deliver the therapy in the home setting uh, when when you need it. Yeah. Well, I I I can tell you. Uh uh, I, I became acquainted with the superficial location of the nerve. I think it's called a lateral perineal nerve uh, over the uh, fibula, yeah. where, where, where probably your device works for the foot drop. That's correct. Yeah, we're stimulating that uh, common perineal nerve. Common um, perineal nerve, okay. Yeah, so that nerve runs on the lateral side of the leg, and then it actually branches uh, branches off. So if you catch it right at that point, you're catching all the branches of that nerve, which is what's um, what's uh, raising the, raising and lowering the, the foot during during gait. Yeah, I, I saw some patients. I was in the emergency room, and uh, uh, both the patient and I were kind of scared because a, a patient just bruised his nerve playing racquetball. He yep. accidentally hit that nerve over the fibula, and he had a foot drop. And he came into the emergency room. Of course, we were puzzled. But he it spontaneously returned. But that that showed me how superficial that nerve is, uh, and all. And it made me think when you gave your presentation was, oh, geez, I wonder if they've also worked with the superficial location of the ulnar nerve. You know how the funny bone, you yeah, kind of yeah. simulate that. Have you guys been working with that with hand rehab? Yeah, that's uh, you know. The, the devices for the upper extremity really focused in on central nervous system pathology, so not not having a peripheral nerve trauma, 
But okay. we do see where that trauma, that peripheral nerve, uh, or an entrapment right at the elbow there, the ulnar nerve, uh -huh. we, you know, does cause that mononeuropathic pain. And we have done implants of the stem rotter at that location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's, that's the only other area I can think of. The nerve is so superficial, very superficial. So, okay, Gene, any comments or questions? Any more for Joel? That's all for me. Thank you, Joel. I think Joel's going to go train now. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, to your point about the perineal nerve injury. Even runners that uh, run hard downhill, right? They've been, been known to cause injury to that nerve. So it is a very sensitive nerve. Well, that's a common runner injury. Correct. Yep. You know, Joel, I, maybe someday we'll introduce you to this uh, cardio thoracic surgeon that's also a triathlete. We had him on on uh, on a hangout, and he was he was talking with another neurosurgeon from Mexico who's a triathlete. Uh, th these guys are serious, uh, uh, serious, and they go to go. To, one, one of the doctors, uh, Dr. Larry Creswell. I don't know if you've heard of Larry, but he goes to triathlons and he uh, he's very active treating injuries of triathletes. But we'll talk about that later. Well, I thank you very much, Joel, for coming out and giving a presentation of your products. And thank you very much, Gene, for coming. And uh, thank you, stay tuned for further episodes. Good thank day, you. Joel. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thanks, Gene. Take care.